change, you have to behold, lay hold of the glory. Amen? The good thing is, like a, like a shuttle that has been set to go to a specific port, God, amen, eternal purpose is to set you to be transformed into the image of glory or to behold the glory. So the Holy Spirit works hard to show it to you and for you to stay in it. Because once you stay in it, you're going to be changed into it. So if I can stay into it, I shall be transformed into it. Transformed into it. You see what, what stopped the transformation? You're losing. You ever try to trace a pattern? You ever try to trace something? Like when I was a kid, we had this, you may put something under a paper. Trace paper. You, yeah. Yes. What messes up this? You, you, something move it. And then you don't know where the line go. Mm -hmm. And then you're just making up the process. And then when you try to match it up, it doesn't work. Come here. Why sometimes our Christianity looks lopsided or you, you, one part looks very correct. You go, man, they're dead accurate in this presentation of being Christ. But you go, what's that distorted wedge-like image? The problem is they have lost the glory. Somewhere along the line, the enemy has switched them up. Amen? Somewhere along the line, he did the Adam and Eve. He gave them another substitute. The Bible said in Romans chapter 1 and 2, Amen? They trade the glory of the living God. The creator for what? The creator. Hallelujah. So the scripture said, as you see, Amen? All of us, Amen? As in a mirror, Amen? The glory of the Lord are constantly being transfigured into His very image. So it shouldn't be sometime transfiguration. It should be what? Constant, the scripture said. The, your transformation stops because you are losing the glory. You're distracted. You're distracted by life, by the people, by the things, by the situation. And every time this happens, the glorious transformation will stop. It's why you see a Christian sometimes, they're moving rapidly. Just to be in their presence or to hear them talk, you're experiencing Christ. Amen. You're experiencing life and light. And then as a sudden, and you're like, why do I experience so much fear or confusion or agitation or anger? And what they have lost is the glory. Yeah. They've now replaced it. Something else is in their hand that they're traced in. And their life will exemplify this out of weird shape. Amen? In the name of Jesus. The Bible said it should be in ever increasing splendor. And from one degree of glory to another. For this come from the Lord who is a spirit. This is an ordinance, a command, a decree of the Lord. That you are supposed to be changed into what? Glory. The Bible said in Hebrews chapter 2. Christ came to bring many sons into what? Glory. The Lord then came to die just to save you. Yes, He needs to atone you to begin the eternal purpose. Because He needs to justify you. But once you're justified, He sets you on the path of what? Glory. Transformation into glory. He wants everything about you exemplify and heavenly dignity. How you be, what you say, what you do, where you go, how you do it. No, you cannot exemplify this heavenly dignity unless you're beholding the heavenly glory. Amen. Are you listening to what I'm saying? It's not trying order. It's not the nonsense, what will Jesus do? It's I can't do but what Jesus do because of the glory of Jesus that permeates in me. Jesus that saturates me. It's Jesus doing me. If I have to do what Jesus is doing, Jesus is doing what Jesus is supposed to be. Doing. <laughs> Are you listening to what I'm saying? If I have to do what the divine nature or the glory do, then the glory is working through him. That's real. That means Jesus are Are you listening to what I'm saying? If Elias, when he was in Jazzy Chummy, he has to make the umbilical cord produce the food, the umbilical cord is working. No, he just sit back and Jazzy through the umbilical cord send the what? Nutrients upon? 
nutrients. Are you listening to what I'm saying, church? It's now what will Jesus do? It's like, if you just stand, amen, amen, you will see the glory of Jesus coming through. You know, the glory of the Lord. When you see the New Testament, you, you see the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Amen. In Genesis, when Abraham behold the three men. Mm. Yes. They, they look different. Yes. He immediately play obesity. Behold. Immediately. Amen. Wow. Because he wanted to pay reference because the glory of the Lord. The heavenly dignity oh. was there. Amen. Why many people do not show the reverence for God because those representing God are not beholding the glory. They might say, well, I have come here as a representative of God. But there's nothing about there should be a reverence that make you want to behave a certain way. Yes. But there's nothing make you want to do this. Because what you're seeing is them. You're seeing the one that give away the glory, which is the first Adam. He had it. He was in the process. But he gave it, he tried to run back to complete it. But by then he was what? Contaminated and God will not complete contamination. There should be an heavenly dignity. Something, something I don't know what to call it. Go, There's something different about this person. There's something godly. There's something peaceful. There's something loving. There's just something very different and very good. It's the heavenly dignity. It's the glory. It's the divine nature. He said, all of us must behold this glory. All of us must change from glory to glory. With ever increasing consistency and continuity. Until we all get to the height where the only thing we see or anybody, and especially God, see, is His Son. This is God's eternal purpose. I want to share a practical process to you. I don't know if Jane could bring up. I've had Jane and Mama to... Um, Put a little. I was, I was, I was, I, I, I was um, reading up on something, and I think it illustrates greatly what we are trying, what the Lord is doing, and, and, and might give you a little better understanding of this process. It's called a parabolic mirror or a parabolic reflector. Now, the parabolic mirror or reflector does not have light of itself, but it has the ability to receive light and to reflect light, so that when someone comes in contact with it, you understand. It will experience pure light that you will actually think the parabolic mirror maybe is light. But no, it just receives, collects light, and manifests light. I want to see if my man Jane can bring it up. And I just want you to read a little bit. Um, I share this with some of you on Wednesday night. The Wednesday night our fellowship already is familiar with this concept. But that's the, the, everyone that's watching us on YouTube and the internet might not be familiar on the Sunday church. So I want you to be familiar just with a little bit of background here before we get into the process. In the name of Jesus. Then we're going to talk about this because we operate very similar. Or should. Or supposed to operate with a very, very similar um, experience and the way that we receive light and manifest light. And you'll see what the Lord has to say about this matter. In Jesus' name. We need to behold, just like how the, the parabolic mirror or reflector beholds light, and then when the light meets that apex, it's reflect back towards where it's directed, so we are supposed to, in Jesus' name. Amen. To God be the glory. Hallelujah. Amen. What, what, what you'll see what an apparatus does, and we are God's digni amen, dignified apparatus that should be reflecting His Christ. In every situation, I don't care what the situation, not just in Sunday, and not just when we come together. At your home, in your everyday move, in the store, amen, etc. All the time. And as I said, what stops it is the one, the shadow that he said must be put away. The Bible said in Romans chapter 6, verse 11, we must present ourselves as one. Amen. Resurrected from the dead. 
God expects you always to interplay with him as a resurrected being and he expects you to interplay with people, things, situations, circumstances all the time as a resurrected being. Amen? In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Sorry, I'm trying to just get this thing up. If we can't do it, then my mother's bring it up on my phone. Hoping that they, they get a chance to see it. In Jesus' name. I sent you the email so I can you can just go to your email. Yeah. I'm just gonna read if we can't seem to bring it up on our, our thing. Maybe I'll get it sent so you got a little bit of background. A, a parabolic mirror is a special shaped object designed to capture, so it's an object specially shaped. The shape is designed in a way to capture energy and focus it to a single point. Amen? So it's like a funnel. That's why a funnel is designed to catch liquid or whatsoever and then focal, focus it into the, in, into the point so everything can run into the bottle or where you're trying to put it. A parabolic mirror or reflector work very much the same. It may also work as a way of distributing energy from the focus point back outwards. Parabolic mirrors may also be referred to as parabolic dishes or parabolic reflector. So if I think of it, if you think of as I said, like a funnel, it can catch light or energy or sun or water and then it can focus it. Amen? God has made us and get us ready and equipped us like a parabolic mirror that we can receive his light and his life and its abundance and the heavenly abundance and able to what? Reflect it or direct it to the point that he focuses Focusing is focusing on, focusing us on. Yeah, just like a laser. Amen. Perfect, like a laser. We receive this light of or this energy, and we can refocus it to where God wants it to be, to accomplish His will. Perfect. Amen. Yeah. Now there's a unique process here that goes on. One of the earliest use of the parabolic mirror was in Isaac Newton reflecting telescope of the 17th century. By using the parabolic mirror. Reflecting telescope correct some of the, amen, the abrasion which exists in older refracting telescope. With the use of parabolic mirror, however, some other problems are introduced. This include a problem called coma, which exists in all telescope using parabolic mirror. Coma cause any object viewed through the telescope which are not at the center of the field of vision to look slightly wet shaped. The farther outside the field they are, the more distorted they appear. And so it is with Christian. When you're not fully in the light, you'll find the object you're looking at look weird or distorted. This is why you hear sometimes a Christian prophesies part of it is right and part of it is what? Correct. The problem is they're not in the center of the field of light. And the things they're seeing, they're not seeing all of it. So they use their imagination to fill in what? The rest. They will start to prophesy or declare something God showed them in prayer or, or communion. And part of it is correct. But because it's not, they're not in the center of the light, the other part, when you got, well, that don't, I, the first part I can see, but the second part, I don't know where you get it. That second part comes from themselves. They assume based on what they know and based on their experience, they came to a conclusion. But not necessarily the object is exactly that. You need to see the object in its entirety to declare it properly. It is why in the, in the Old Testament, when you look like Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah, God will go, Son of man, what did you see? And then make him. Yes, rebuttal what he see. Then if he say it exactly as it is, God would say you are seeing what? Right. And God didn't do this like one time. You do it again. You got look again, son of man. Son of man, describe what you see. And again, you gotta do it. When Adam was naming the animal, he had pure light. So he can name all of them exactly for what it is. But since the fall, we see how? In part. And we know what? In part, so the Bible says, therefore we prophesy what? In part, it's never complete. You need to have enough light to be able to prophesy accurately. You need to make sure when you're seeing the thing, it's not wet shape or distorted. Amen? 
but you're seeing it in its actual state. Hallelujah. I think mommy is finally getting it up. <laughs> and the last component, again, there's quite a bit of write-up on this process. Aside from amateur telescope, many people have interacted with a parabolic mirror in the form of popular optical illusion toy. This small pan, amen, has two parabolic mirrors attached to one another and a hole in the top to allow placement of a small object. When an object is placed between the two parabolic mirrors, it appears that the object is in fact resting in the hair or a few inches above where it actually is. The last component I wanted to share with you is that during the World Olympic, the flame used for the, for the Olympic torch is lit using a large parabolic mirror. This parabolic mirror collects where am I? a piece of sunlight and focuses it to an intensity sufficient to ignite the torch material. So they'll use the sunlight and focus it at a certain um, temperature that the torch just ignite. Well, vice versa, the same way, when God wants to clean or help a person or a thing, or a family, what happened, God is so, should be able to focus his light upon you, and anyone or anything in the proximity is supposed to become what? Illuminated. This is why when the lady touched the hem of Jesus' coat, because he's so much in the light, anything touches him is what? Is lit up. If it's help, what they want, they'll get help. If it's peace, what they want, they'll get peace. If it is joy, if it's salvation, if it's strengthening. Because the abundance of the light, and you who operate like a parabolic reflector, receive this delight and shine it to where God intended it to be. Now the Bible gives a warning about this process. The Bible said, until you are good at beholding the light, it said, you must use what you reflected also with the word of God. Make sure the word of God matches up what you are reflecting in Jesus' name. In order not to give distorted prophecies and declaration or wet shape like declaration or prophecy, the Bible teaches in 2 Peter 1 9, you must pair up what you're seeing with the Word of God until you have enough light that you're clear. You're seeing the thing in its entirety. Amen? If you go quickly to 2 Peter, we're almost there. 2 Peter. Um, finally got it up. Amen. We'll send it out to the church. Mm. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19. Oh, it's a new scripture. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19 read, And we have the prophetic word made former still. You will do well to pay close attention to it as to a lamp shining in a dismal, mm. squalid, and dark place. Say so the because we live in a very dismal and dark place, use the word of God as a lamp to shine light, to bring clarity, to know what thing is, what people is, what situation. It's a treat it as a lamp. Treat the prophetic word of God as a lamp of how you examine darkness. Because things, even the environment you live in is so dark, use the word of God to see what you're dealing with. Does it match up with the prophetic word? Prophets are those who is control and assigned to carry out God's will. So all the things God is planning to do and the area that they are working in, these things are shown to them to, to bring light to the people, to highlight it to the people. Amen? Second so, Peter 3. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 19. Sorry. So the Bible says, use the word of God, like when you use a lamp, when you're in a dark, squalid, amen, or dismal place. And so you keep doing that until the day breaks through. The gloom. Amen. The gloom. So until all the darkness, you know when the sun rises in the morning, 
when this darkness and then the sun start to rise and it breaks through all the gloom, where all the darkness does fade away and everything become bright. The Bible said, you must use the word of God until the day breaks, until, think of daylight being break through the gloom. And the morning star rises, come into being into your heart. So until the sun is at full, let's call it noon, until the bright morning star is like noon and shining in your heart so bright that anything in, in view is not in wet shape or disturbed, but it's very clear. The Bible says, until this, use the word of God to see if what you're seeing match up. Because in the word of God, you will either find in the past, someone of us had to deal with it. In the present, someone of us have, is dealing with it. Or someone will be dealing with it in, in the future. God works in alignment with the word of God. So the thing you are seeing will fall into one of these areas. Abraham has dealt with it. Pastor Chow is dealing with it now. Amen. Or in the future, the Millennium Kingdom will be dealing with it. You will find, so it's a, until you are good at operating as a parabolic mirror or reflector, until you're a funnel that catches the light properly, use the word of God to make sure what you're seeing in the funnel is what it is. That oh, now only half of the funnel have light and you're making up what's on the second half. Amen? And then just because you funnel the juice or the water into a bottle or a pan, you must shine this light. Just because, just because the parabolic dish receives the light from the sun, and then light the torch. Each one of us, God sent to different people, things, and situation. Amen. Just like He sent Peter to light up the house of Cornelius. Amen. He sends you to light different people. All the different candles that are no longer lit, that live in constant darkness. They're not clear in their thoughts, not clear in their mind, clear in their feelings, clear in their family, clear in their resource. They're in a perpetual state of confusion and anxiety and fear. Anybody living in darkness is in perpetual what? Fear. Do you know why we fear so much? The unknown. The unknown. Fear is produced tremendously because of unknown uncertainty. You can't tell what's going on or what's going to happen. Your soul naturally goes, this makes me uncomfortable, all this uncertainty. So God said, I'm going to send light that you stop living in this perpetual state of what? Uncertainty. You don't know what's going on. You don't know if you're going. You don't know if you're coming. You don't know if God loves you. You don't know if you're justified. You don't know if you're dignified, if you're in a heavenly state or you're not. You don't know God's eternal purpose, that you're destined. The church is destined to be the image of God and still some of us live in the Bible being tossed to and fro. You don't even know what you're going. You don't even know what's going on. That's a terrible state for a Christian. A Christian, the Bible said, is a son of light. You're supposed to live in a state of knowing, not unknowing. Hallelujah. So the scripture said, until you get clear, use the word of God to help you to know the things you ought to know. Because you haven't had the experience yet. You haven't seen it yet. It's too distorted in the light, in the parabolic mirror. Amen? It's still too wet shape. So it said, use the word of God so you know what you should know. So you know the things you should know about God. You know the things you should know about you. Use the word of God. When you come together, study the word of God so that you become clear. This is to remove the uncertainty. Now what you think, now what you feel. What does the word of God say? Now the next scripture after that is crucial. Because if not, you won't use the word of God if you don't have verse 20. In order to understand the importance of verse 20, I love what the apostle did through the Holy Spirit. Or I should, or I should say, I love what the Holy Spirit did through the apostle. Verse 20 said, Yet... First, you must understand. Say, I must understand this. I must understand Note this. it. So in order to understand 19, you have to understand 20. So this is why the apostle said, Yeah, first you must understand this, that no prophecy of scripture is a matter of any personal or private or special interpretation. Loosening, amen? Amen? Or solving. Let's actually get one to verse 21 too. For no prophecy ever originate because... Some man will it, amen, to do so. It never came by human impulse, 
But men spoke from God who were born along, moved and impelled by the Holy Spirit. No prophecy comes from man. Because God has to shine the light for you to see what to prophesy is what? About. So you go, you go, you need to understand why you got to all. Because some go, well, I'm afraid of the word of God. You go, no, no. This word did not come from man or man impulse. It came from the Holy Spirit for man, but by God. God didn't want you to live in darkness. So he said, until you learn to be a good parabolic mirror, I'm going to give you a written word till you can learn to follow the living word. Because you're not good, as you'll see the next two scriptures we're going to cover, at beholding the light. So I'm going to give you something that you can read even when you're not in the light. Or not holding to the light. So you go, yet you need to know this. This word that you must use as a lamp did not come from man, did not originate or come from people's impulse. This is why sometimes when people go, they're prophesying. You must learn to see where they're pro Is it from impulse or is it because they're operating in the parabolic mirror? in the light or is it they know the will of God from the word because they can't prophesy from there too one of the two has to happen either from the word or they're very good at operating what in the light now we're going to look at that next component how does prophecies happen the Bible said it must not come from ill past. I feel this what you feel doesn't count that is not the word of God that is not the, the light amen or it doesn't originate, but well, I have this idea. Or you got to say, I'm prophesying about me. Amen? I'm making a determination or a prediction, but it's not a prophecy. It has to be from you. That's an impulse or an idea from you. Prophecies come from the Holy Spirit. Something was show, placed in between, at the center of the light, for you to see it. The Bible says in Psalm 36, verse 9, it's in your light we see light. light. And Psalm 43, verse 3 said, Amen. O oh God, send forth your light and truth. Lead me by your light and truth into your presence and your dwelling. So the light has to lead you into, into seeing the thing properly, into the, into the true reality of it. Hallelujah. Now, we got two more scriptures to cover for today for the first part of this process, God's eternal purpose. Let's go to uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 12, verse 35. Then we have one more John. Hallelujah. Now, actually, Mama, just before we go to John, I have one last, uh, I have one more audible to do. I want to go to Malachi, Malachi chapter 3. Just a few verses in Malachi from verse 2. Malachi. Malachi chapter 3 from verse 2. We're almost there. Malachi 3, and I want to read um, verse but, 2 to 5. But who can endure the day of his coming? Yeah. What's up? He said, Amen. Amen. Malachi chapter 3 from verse 2 read, But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? Mm -hmm. So when the Lord appears, when the Lord appears. everything illuminates. Everything illuminates. This is why the Bible says the Gospel of John, they like darkness, so they avoid light. You see, light always makes things visible. Light shows you what you're seeing, what you're not seeing, where you're standing, what's around you, what's in you. It illuminates things. So the Bible says, who can stand the day of his appearing? Now let's see what happened when he appeared. For he is like a refiner's fire. And like a fuller soul. Now fuller soul and refine the fire, refine things. Any place Christ appears, things start to refine. Any place Christ appears, things start to be clean like a fuller soul. Darkness starts to be dispelled. Sickness starts to be replaced by help. Amen? Lack of peace starts to be replaced by peace. Any place Christ appears, things start to be returned to the way God intended it. Any place Christ is not, things go on course, unrefined. Are you listening to what I'm saying? Before I truly know the Lord, I don't know about refinement. Mm -hmm. The Bible said we are, we, we are crude and undeveloped. Before Christ comes in your life, you'll find you could be a Christian, but you'll find you're, you're kind of rough and clumsy and coarse. Once He comes in, the refining what? Begins. Hallelujah. 
Once he comes in, he starts to refine and begin the cleaning. The state has to start to move towards the image or the heavenly dignity. Hallelujah. The thoughts have to change. And the behavior has to change. The refining begins. The Bible said once he appeared, he's like a refiner's finer and a fuller soul. Verse 3 said, he will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he will purify the priests, the sons of Levi. And refine them like gold and silver. That they may offer to the Lord's offering of righteousness. God wants what you do, all the things you reflect, to be things of what? Righteousness. It's perfect righteous character. The only way he can do that, he has to refine you. You see, some of us, we have a big heart. We don't mind offering God things. But they're not what? Righteous. And the reason they're not righteous, we are not refined. Somebody ever give you some clothes or something, you know, but it hasn't been clean or something, and but you can see their heart in it. They're so uh, good intention, but the thing is not good. And you go, I appreciate the, um, the gesture, but uh, I'll pass. No. God wants righteous gifts. Because the gifts God gives you are what? Holy and good and sacred. But to you to, for you to reciprocate this, He needs to what? Refine you. He needs to wash you. Amen? He said, I need to wash you like you're white as snow. So therefore, the things that you reflect to me are what? Proper. Amen? Now God said, once I've done this, Look at verse 5 now. Then I will draw near to you for judgment. I will be swift. I will be a swift witness against the sorcerer, against the adulterer, against the false swearer, and against those who oppress the hireling in his wage, the widow and the fatherless, and who turn aside the temporary resident from his right. And fear not me, say the Lord of hosts. God said, I can move in swift and clear up things once you are refined. So, as I said, the Holy Spirit has been given to us and working to get us to the image by refining us. It's not sometimes we don't have some of the image, but when we release it, we're like, ooh. You know, I, I remember I watched a movie and um, the girl is like, like, she's training to be something. And when she moved, actually it was a guy watching her. He, he goes, what you think? And he goes, if you're training to be a barbarian, you're in first class line. He goes, if the focus, she was training to be a model. And she kind of walked up rough, you know, and he goes, he goes, everything about that hurt me. Everything about that was painful. And she goes, I don't think that was so bad. He goes, if you're training to be a barbarian, you're dead on line. You are on, on track. He goes, but you are training to be a model. So that won't cut it. You know, just, it's just rough. If she was training to be a soldier, maybe. You know, but not, definitely not a model. She was just one of the boys, you know what I mean? <laughs> and so forth. So she had to be refined how to be and how to talk. And what